And three and two and one. Thank you for joining. I hope you're all doing okay. Hope you're doing pretty good. What we're going to do is we're going to go back into the Mongols because uh, the word Kahitan and Hittites are just all in here. All right, if I type it in here and you see how many times it pops up on the sidebar, all oh, from the top to the, from the very beginning to the very end, it just pops, pops, pops. So what we want to do is we want to first make sure the viewer understands what we're going to aim for, the connection between the Kahitan, who are the Hittites, and then we're going to show you that they're the Mongols, right? Uh, hey, man, but there were other videos where you said Hittites are this and that. Okay. I don't care. Hey, man, there's other videos that other people say hit tight to this. I don't care. And let me show you why. Don't let me make you think, oh, it doesn't matter. Everybody is. Now, you see here it says related ethnic groups. Okay? Now, we're looking at the Mongol people. The related ethnic groups to the Mongols are the proto before they were Mongols. Proto Mongols. Before they were Mongols, they were Mongols. And then, what does it say? The Kehitan people. So, related, like brothers. Like this brother went this way with this woman, and then they created people. And this brother went this way with this, and they were now these two brothers were in the same. They were proto-Mongolic, huh? And then they were Mongols. But then one brother went the other way and said, "Because I have this prime piece of woman, we are gonna call ourselves something different." Okay, so keep that in mind. All right. Um. And then it says Mongolic peoples. Now, again, this starts with the Mongols. Do not be confused with Mongolic peoples. Well, okay, look. So they're saying that the raiders that made themselves into an army that everybody was afraid of because they would just come and bring war to your doorstep to take your goods because they're on horseback and they don't have time to sit and watch a harvest because there's too much shit to steal, kill, and destroy. So, understand the difference. There's Mongols and there's Mongolic peoples. So, what are you saying? Like, this is the Mongols, the men that went out and killed everybody, and then the Mongolic peoples are their women and children that they came back to? So why would somebody write them separate if they're just the same in people? Alright. Alright, like I said, I know we went through this before. We got about halfway through, but I wasn't highlighting what I should have been highlighting. So I want you to look at the populations throughout the world, right? Uh in China, six million, in excluding, not counting the Duars, whoever the Duars might be, because this is the first time we've even seen this name. So that's telling you that the Duars are Mongols as well. They live in China, but they're not even counted as Mongol because when one brother takes this woman and goes this way, it makes some people, and the other brother take this woman and go this way and make some people then you get a division of names so gonna go backwards real quick and we're looking at the Kahitan to see the connection to the Hittites and we don't have to go too far Kahitan large script so that's the language right writing system so this should this should be very easy since we don't play with language that much, but you can't get away from language 
in the time of Babel, when when two groups can talk to each other, that means they're from the same, from the same. And why, why do two groups that had the same language start speaking different languages? Because one brother went this way with this woman and started speaking with that woman and her people, and he then ruled over their people. And then the other brother went this way with this woman, and they took this name, and her people talked this language. Now, what happens? One brother goes this way, and he already has a language. And if he's controlling shit, every time he goes around his woman's people, and he says, hand me the paper towels, and they don't understand what he's saying, now you have confusion. Something has to dominate the conversation. Either he's going to teach everybody that these are paper towels or everybody's going to call it what they called it and he's going to accept their name. Okay? And they'll call it table cleaner. And that's the difference because what happens on the other side? You have the other brother that went the other way with the other people that spoke a different language and the same thing. Every time he says, hand me this or hand me that or hand me the pistachios, they say what? We don't speak. What the f is a pistachio? So now he goes and gets the pistachios himself, opens them up, shows them to the people saying, this is what I wanted. And they're like, whoa, we don't call it pistachio. We call it blah, blah. Now you have who's got more power, the people or the man that's ruling the people. And either they're going to call it pistachio or they're going to change the name to Gimache. Just imaginary names, right? So this is what we're having the whole way through history. And again, the, the term, the phrase, as above, so below. Who chooses these things? If above, they said, we're going to deal with Babel, punish them. So now, guy goes into a new land with his new woman, talking to their people, and now they're going to spend 40 years making their new language so that they can communicate with each other and the brother over here right he's going to be passive so they'll only spend five years working on their new language so working on a language is like a baby in the oven it takes time five years working on a new language now they are ready for war. These guys still got 20-something years working on a new language. See how that's going to be a problem? How can you go to a war with a split language? Get them! What? Attack! What? Subjugate! What? What is he saying? So that's why you can't, you can't go to war with a language that you can't communicate with. Kitan, kit, kit, and, right? You hit and run. Hit tight, hit and run. Hit hat, large script was one of two writing uh, systems. Used for the uh, now extinct Kahit time. Okay, so Chinese and Hittites, Babylonians, Phoenicians, Venetians, Cy Cyprus, Cypretian, Cyprian, Cyprians, Hittites, and other dwellers in Chaldea. So I want you to think about this. 
they said, no, 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 all this stuff is Babylon, and Babylon is the center of the world. Okay, so if you got your imaginary map up, they think that you are idiots, and they want you to believe that the center of the world in the past was what they call the old world, where they show you the map without Americas. These people had a map that showed the stars in every position, which told people that came after them they could travel everywhere. If they could travel everywhere, everybody that came after them had the ability to travel everywhere. That's why you find Roman helmets, Greek swords, Greek buildings, Roman buildings in the Americas that are clearly built well before the Circassians or the or the African tribes came here. When I say the African tribes, I mean the Goths. So, and, and, and that, that is not even mentioning all the evidence of all the researchers that showed that whomever lived in Africa, black, white, red, all those different people seem to have their own way of getting here well before what we've been told was colonization day, which means they were riding the currents and they were taking the currents here for a long time the easiest way to prove this uh which i'm not going to go in depth with is dr ivan sertima which shows uh his study of the banana and the name of the banana and everybody having the banana and the different names being the same root of banana, banku. So the banana, wherever it originates from, was spread throughout the world by the same people because everybody's dialect of the banana is ba button like the word ban but it's hyphen between b and that mean the a in the end button is the root of banana so actually shows where everybody's coming from and going to Again, to make yourself famous, and I mean God famous, in the old world, you had to produce laws, and people had to be judged by those laws. That's what made you a God, your words carved in stone. So they want us to believe the center of the world is Iraq, Iran, what they call the Middle East. This is telling us something different. This is telling us the center of the world is the Asian area because you can't leave out the Americas and say the world. So if you took the Asian land and put it in the center, everything radiates from it like a star. We look at Europe, it's one branch. You look at Africa, it's another branch. Look at Australia and the islands of the Sea of Oceania, it's another branch. You look at the Americas, it's another branch. Everything's branching away from the Orient. Hmm? The center of orientation.
Now, Hindu Chinese elements influence the, the Olmecs. Right? So it says, two sons of Canaan, right? Hef and the Sinites are likely dominant. Much of China was ruled by the Sino Kahitan Empire from 960 to 1126. Wow, that's the same thing I've been saying in all these videos. The Brandon Lau dynasty. Hmm? You came from Canaanite greatness, and now you fell, and look at how huh? destiny is. Three and two and one. I just sat here talking to my wife about this shit. You know, it's funny how in the past we were all like at each other's throats and shit, right? Killing each other, warring with each other. And now it's a thousand years later and we're all high fives and bar hops and book hops. Funny hmm? how we get here after all the warring. And then we're not done, right? We still have wars to go to get rid of some people, right? Make others blossom into what they need to be in this generation. Interesting plan, right? Of course, as we're always told in the Bible, man cannot understand the plans of heaven. We can't understand the reasoning behind why it's done. Select people from every group that's ever existed have been pulled together into one basket to weave the end time children. Imagine if we weaved those children a thousand years ago and then those children made it and then just made it into something completely different than what the plan originally was. And what is the plan? It's very obvious, isn't it? It's to mix up all the races. So in the end, you have a golden race. And then what happens with the golden race? Well, it seems by promise, certain tribal males get to create these children and those children carry on their ethnicity into the next world. That's why when we mix, all our children look alike. Gold. All right, um, let's get back to it. So here's one that says, who are the descendants of the Hittites? And it says the Hittites are ancient people who lived in Anatolia region in Asia, which is modern day Turkey. So again, those people don't live in Turkey today. They were moved out of Turkey. The people that live in the Turkey today that call themselves Turks, uh, they at one point were mixing with uh, what they call the Guk, which is the people of Nippon, and they created what is called the Guk Turk. Now, when I say mixing, I don't mean they were having sex to create this. There was a tribe. It was a tribal confederation, which means it was one tribe from here, one tribe from here, which means the people of Japan used to live where you have Turkey today, right? So it's a portion of Japan, 
a portion of the Mongols and a portion of what we call Turks today. All right. Now, what they did is they made a con uh, confederation, and we're going to read about it here. That means Mongol in the Gupta Turk confederation was fighting Mongol, meaning they didn't agree, meaning one brother went with one wife, the other brother went with the other wife, and those two tribes eventually went back against each other. Now, as we go into this, it will kind of explain it, except for the problem is we don't necessarily know which ones are originals and which ones are con convoluted now, convoluted, mixed, convoluted, mixed together. Now, again, just because we use the term mixed together doesn't necessarily mean they were screwing. What it usually means is their elites were screwing. So, here it says, I'm going to start with Mongol again, the East Asian ethnic group native to Mongolia and to China's inner Mongolia. So, that's the region just north of China, <coughs> the surrounding mountains, the surrounding desert. <coughs> Mongols are the principal member, male members, of the more large family of Mongolic peoples. So, <coughs> Mongols are bound together by a common heritage and ethnic identity. So this is what they give you for the image of Mongols. And as you see from the image of Mongols, dark to light, black to white, blonde hair, black hair. Now, you do understand from just looking at this, this has nothing to do with ethnicity, right? Today, you have people that have gone into different regions, and once they go into those regions, they assimilate, and they're Americans now, or they're Canadian now. And then they play a game of Canadian and French Canadian. Now, again, what is the original ethnic identity of the Mongols? Because their capital where their army is called the Mongols, their people aren't the Mongols. You have all these different ethnic, uh, ethnicities grouped together. It's the question is, what is the ethnic group of the Mongols? And this again, number one, we know what a Mongol looks like. Is it, is it, is it Asiatic, is it a Oriental? Usually when we see Mongols, they are of the bigger, stronger sort. They look beefy and strong. That we we very very rarely see someone skinny or frail of the Mongol culture. I'm going to use culture right now because again, when we take this route and we try to go to the beginning and nail it down, the ethnic identity is mixed up because we're in the future and we're going back to the past. So, I hope you understand what I'm saying, especially new people, or newish, newer, however you want to look. So, the ancestors of the modern day Mongols are referred to as the Proto. Here we see the Proto Mongols here. The Proto-Mongols emerged from an area that has been inhabited by humans, humans and predecessor hominid species as far back as the Stone Age. The people went through the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, forming tribal alliances, peopling and coming into conflict with early China. Proto-Mongols formed various tribal kingdoms that fought against each other for supremacy, such as the Ruran Cognate, until it was defeated by the Guk Turks. 
So again, not being racist when I sit there and say gook and Turk or anything like that or combining, all right? I'm not saying gook out of hate. I'm not saying Turk out of hate. I'm not saying anything out of hate. And shut up. I'm teaching you what this shit is. So, as we go first, it says, who founded the first Turkic cognate. Now, you see the area that the Turkic cognate controlled. Again, now above that, the Mongols had different cognates that controlled that. So you have to say, excuse me, Ruhran, right? Here's Tibetan. Now below Tibetan would be the area on the map that showed the Turks. Now, if we go back to this map, Mongolia, China, Tibet would be right in here. All right. So if you say this is where Tibet would be, look how high the Turks controlled. They controlled Mongolia itself. All right. So once the Ruran are beat, defeated by the Guk Turks, the Ruran got to go back, formulate a new army under a new leader, and then they have to fight the first Turkic cognate. And it's 744. They're defeated in 555. It takes them what? 200 years. 755. Five would be 200 years. So it takes these guys roughly 200 years to come back and, right? Which in turn subdued by the strength of the Chinese Tang Dynasty. So again, let me reiterate that. These guys don't even come back. It's the Chinese, it's the Xin that grow strong within 200 years and take down the Turks. The destruction of the Ugari cognate, right? By the Yen Isi Kurgizer. I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm going to skip that. I'm just going to say Kur when those comes up. Result in the end of the Turkic dominance of Mongolia. Paramongolia, Kahatan people, Kahitan people, right? Founded a Chinese dynasty known as the Lao. All right. So from the Lao dynasty, right? So see, this is going to break down exactly. See, the dynasties are sticking close to the Bible. Their family name has to come from somewhere. The national name is going away from the Bible to hide whom they or everybody else is. Why? Well, because you start growing a tribe, somebody walks by, they see what you're doing, they like what you're doing, they ask, can I help? Can I be part of it? And I dwell with you. They say, yeah, right there, at that point, you are no longer a whole people. Surely you can say the original people group was people A. And people A was living and dwelling here. And a few people from people B came. And now people A and B grow together. But then you get people C, people D, people E, people F, and it doesn't matter what portion of them because the people in the city always know that what? People A were first. They were the aboriginals. People B come and they act like brothers, but people C come and they're like, well, there's only a few of us here. We should invite some more of our people here and we could really turn this into something greater than it is. And people see, then become conquerors. Now they gonna come, they gonna take over against everybody's will. Because they see a vision for what this could be. And they can't do this 
in their land or anybody else's land because just the right amount of things just aren't naturally set up for them there. And this is how lands get taken over and original names get hidden. No. As you see, even in Proto, we get the same names. So the question is, from the Proto to the Mongol, who has been added? That is from B, C, D, and E. Because that's what's going on here. We know the Turks are not the same people. But they're still listed under Proto. Is it because original Mongols went into the Turks? Because it's called Guk Turk, proving the Japanese were there. Because we've looked up Guk Turk before. That's why we say that. Now, if you want to say the Chinese and Japanese. There's not much difference. The Chinese were there. Well, that's fine. I mean, you know, I'm not Chinese. I'm not Japanese. I don't take offense to this or that about uh, what is their history. They might. So here we have, right? The Cahitan founded a Chinese dynasty known as the Lao, showing you that people with the last name Liao are from the Kitan people, right? And they ruled Mongolia and portions of eastern Siberia. Okay, screaming children. Oof. The Lao Dynasty, or Lai, <coughs> ruled Mongolia and portions of the eastern sea coast of Siberia, now known as the Russian Far East. Now again, these uh, Russian Far East, this is, right, Skyvia, right? I presume this is Skyvia. There's Japan. I think this is China. Um, I think this section right here is Mongolia. So that's Skylia, I think. All right, so, and again, these people are coming out of Africa. Again, uh, Chinese DNA Africa. Uh, the best thing to do is go to videos. In this video right here, Chinese DNA, right, relate to Africa. So they, they've they known since that video was done, they've, they've known in their history, once the DNA comes forth, in whatever year it was, uh, then it's, it's set in stone. There's nothing that they can do to argue this or that. When you go into the history of uh, Chinese and their relation to all the other Asiatic groups, so if you can prove through DNA Chinese are from Africa, which they already accidentally did, then that proves that all their cousins and brothers are all from Africa too. When you look up the word Sin Im, Sin Im, I'll just do it just to show you. All right. Okay. Oh, see, somebody says it's in Isaiah. All right, so sin in. Let's, let's go with this one. Even simple Wikipedia, right? Now, Aswan, 
Aswan is in Africa, right? It's a city in South Egypt. Them using Aswan shows, right? Some English versions simply tra translate the word as Cyrene or Aswan. Others associate sent him to China. So what are they telling you there? They're, they're telling you that they were in Egypt, they were in a section of Lower Egypt, and they built shit thousands of years ago before they made their march over to China. That's what it's showing you. That's their, the, these towers uh, in Aswan show their connection to their cousin Mizrahim. They were living in the city of Mizra, uh, associated with the cities of Mizrahim. And what they do? They outgrew them. So here they even go to Latinize it. You get Quinn. Okay. So the Quinn dynasty founded in 221 BC by Quinn Shang Hoang Di. He had conquered all the other warring states and unified them. He's the emperor that unified China. So he conquered all the other Canaanites and made them fall under one. This is why you're basically going to realize all Chinese are not the same tribe of China. There are other tribes, there are mingled tribes, you know, just like America, you know, um, when you, when you can see the, uh, the racial mixing of uh what you call uh non-colors black and white when a non-color white mixes with a non-color black you get a colored person so i mean these children don't look when you mix black and white you get gray these children don't look gray to me do they these children look gray to you All right, so remember they're telling you the Quinn should be the sin. It's being called the Quinn because it's Latinized. Look how the equation is right here in the sentence. All you got to do is open your eyes. What does that mean? Oh, that means that um, Latin people played a name game with you so you couldn't tell people's bid. Again, the Quinn dynasty would be read today as the Shin dynasty if it was not Latinized. So who changed those people's name so you couldn't read it and attribute it to the Bible? What peoples did that? these people so the latin people changed everybody's name right because you're speaking english latin they changed everybody's name so what so you couldn't connect people's names to the bible sounds like the devil to me sounds like the devil to me too Go back over. And it says, over the next hundred years, the Jershans in China suitably encouraged warfare among the Mongols as a way to, of keeping them distracted from in invading China. 12th century Genghis Khan was able to unite and conquer the warring tribes, forging them into a unified fighting force. So the Quinn Dynasty did that with the Chinese, and Genghis Khan did that with what these guys, right? And the British did that too with the tribes of America, and the French did that with the tribes of Canada. Do you see what's happening now? It's the unification of all tribes, that's what this is all about.
So they say over here that Quinn, Quinn Dynasty unified all the people. Where does it say that? Let me find that again. Nah, we ain't look at Quinn State. Whatever. Who gives a shit? But he unified. Oh, found it in seven. All right. And then. So he had a nice 500 years. I'm looking at the exact same place, right? So there we go. The founder of the Quinn, first emperor of the unified China. So China's being unified, right? And he's he's living a short time, buddy. He's living 30 years. He's ruling 30 years, excuse me. All right, so he's unifying China in 220. The Mongols are being unified in 1200. Now, is it the exact same time period? <laughs> they added a thousand years. Don't be an idiot. So, 12th century. Let's pretend China was unified right before this. Let's pretend it 200 years. Let's say 10th century. And then the Gupta Turks in the 11th century. And then Genghis Khan did the Mongols in the 12th century. And then somebody else was done in the 13th century. And then somebody else was unified in the 14th century. And then somebody else was unified in the 15th century. Let's say uh, Spain and Portugal. And then somebody else was unified in the 16th century. And in 1492, they came to America and started war. And then in a few hundred years, and somebody was unified in the 16th century, 17th century, 18th century. And now, mm, are we unified today? In a, not, or, you know, 20 years ago, the 19th, end of the 19th century. You see what's going on? It's a cascade effect. An order is being sent out to unify the people in the land. Boom, that land's done. Order has been sent out. Unify the people of this land. Unify the people of this land. Now what happens? You know the end result. The end result is the unification of the world under one world government so that God has an enemy. I'm not blaming this on God. I'm just saying. And then what? The outcast of the people of this unification, outcast of the people of this unification, the outcast of the people of that unification, the outcast of the people of this unification, and the outcast of the people of America's unification. Shall then join together and be God's people one day. Bam. Done. Bam. That's what's going on in this book are you reading this book right is everybody's teaching you hey you're not supposed to be learning hate you're supposed to be learning separation it's not the same thing separation is not hate separation is just what it says separate why would god want to separate people you separate ingredients so you can put them together later don't you God baking a cake? We know he's baking a lava cake. And he wants to throw a bunch of people in the lava cake. Because he gave us good and evil. He said, choose. Choose if you're going to be good. Choose if you're going to be evil. Good isn't what you think it is. Evil isn't what you think it is. What do you mean? Well, what is good and what is evil? Hmm? Good and evil is just what we see, me and you, right? Somebody does something, we say, oh, that's good. Now somebody does something, we say, oh, that's bad. But we're confused now. Now we're at a point where we call good things bad. Oh, that was badass, man. And then we call bad things good. Well, he did this. And he's going to be punished. His punishment will be that 
Well, that's good. He deserves it. Well, she didn't want to be pregnant, so she and she went to the doc, and now it's gone. Well, that's good. We don't have to deal with that. And see what how corrupt man's opinion of good and bad can be very fast. Everybody in this world needs help. Yet, when we get ready to have children to help us, we get rid of them. That doesn't make any sense. Well, I need help right now. Well, you can, you can sculpt your help. I need help right now. This is the world. This is how the outcome is going to be. Because of our version of patience. Because hmm? we can't see the bigger plan. I want you to think about something. God tells you. I'm going to scatter you to the four corners of the earth. I'm going to separate you from your women. If he takes your women from you, who are you supposed to mate with? If you're in Russia, ain't none of your women there. Who are you supposed to mate with? You're in Ethiopia. Ain't none of your women there. Who are you supposed to mate with? Hmm? You're in Asia. Ain't none of your women there. Who are you supposed to mate with? God tells you, I'm going to do this. I'm going to set you in these places for an amount of time. And then I'm going to bring you back. Who are you supposed to come back with? You are not the original person he placed in those nations. You are the descendant of the person that he placed in those nations. He gave your daughters of this to these people. He gave your daughters of that to these people. And took your boys over to here. Everybody's mixed. All the nations that fought each other in history. Their descendants are right here, mating with each other today. Trying to play a game we're not supposed to mate. But there's lots of pages in here that talk about when you mate, I'm going to choose out of what you make what I want. What the hell was everybody else reading? You got people that get themselves in real nice clothes, spray themselves up with smell goods, and then sit in front of a fucking camera that nobody can smell them or care what they're wearing. They give you this great presentation, picking and choosing what they're gonna read from. But the truth is, the Most High said, I'm going to make you a Gentile. I'm going to take your nobility status away. And we're being punished. Now, under the rules of Gentile, you just have the law. Now, if you're going to follow the law, that's one thing. If you will fulfill the law, that's another thing. You're on a plane where nobody's paying attention to the law. Very few people are fulfilling the law. The ancient rules were, don't be with a Moabite, or you're out. Don't be with an Ammonite, or you're out. Don't be with a Canaanite, or you're out. But he put us out. 
He took our nobility away. He took our status away. He used the Latins to change everybody's titles. So now you have a confusion of faces where we don't remember who's who anymore. So how could one say, don't sleep with a Canaanite when one doesn't know the face of a Canaanite? How could one say, don't sleep with a Moabite when one doesn't know the face of a Moabite? What would an Ammonite mean to anyone today? Almost to say, even the children of Amman. How many ethnicities know whom they are in the Bible? How many ethnicities pretend? How many ethnicities just don't know? This is the power of war to separate you from your past. That's what war does. Because if you know your past, then you say, well, before we were this, and everybody wants to go upwards. Nobody says, in the past, we were slaves. We want to be slaves today. Show me that quote out of anyone's mouth. So, a lot of things have happened that have switched the positions of everyone and hidden their names even from themselves. So, In the contents of this, they'll just give you the tribe and give you the credits of the tribe. If they grew into an empire, which is a cognate, we're just not calling it. Isn't it funny to sit there and say many empires existed at the same time, but who's controlling history? So if Latins were part of Rome, but they overthrew one half of Rome and added a different peoples to the other half of Rome. Now with them in control, and they weren't before, they get to write themselves into any position and they get to write whoever had a position into any position they want. So again, if Genghis Khan's empire was the greatest ever, here you have the Roman control to rewrite it to say anything it wants. To say Rome is up here. And, uh, since Genghis Khan ain't in power no more, we only achieved this in comparison to us. When we go to that series Netflix has, about Kublai Khan, what is Kublai's? My father had a mandate from heaven that all nations shall know the barbarian way. Do all nations know the barbarian way? The high chiefs of the barbarian. Today, pretend to be the nobles of the world. Today, all the people, all the descendants of the people in the past who were nobles, are the outcasts. Look at how History has turned everything around on all of us.
the Most High's plan from different positions in the plan, it's harsh. I had to come to terms with it a few days ago. It nearly broke me. Trying to understand my little pivotal point in the whole picture. One little dot that doesn't even sparkle versus a galaxy. Of course, a galaxy is fake. It's just the idea of a galaxy versus one person's position that is relatively meaning. Meaning if I wasn't here doing it, the plan would continue and someone else would be here doing it. So, let's do a little bit more of this. And again, we're only halfway through this. We have so much more to conquer, to understand. And then we're going to take a moment and look around with Google Earth. We have to understand why there is a temple out there that matches the model. Why all the surrounding walls of the temple are somehow destroyed. How the inner court wall, two walls are standing, two walls are destroyed. And of course, whatever would be in the, the final position that would resemble the Holy of Holies, of course, what was stripped out of this place. That is now the desert. Now, I want people to understand, I don't taken some time and I've looked into the Bible we've looked at Goshen Goshen said a plague would never touch it does that mean as long as the people were there I don't know anybody can look at that place and see the desertification that has happened to the place which in, a play, in itself is a plague. Nowhere does it say that the temple was at Goshen. So this, this brings a lot of questions. Was it a replica of the temple? Was it another temple built but not recorded? Is it one of the two temples recorded? What I mean by that is there is a northern kingdom and it is a southern kingdom. One is by Damascus and one is not. Now, of course, what we call Syria and Damascus is nowhere near there. So it becomes very questionable about what it all means and where it all goes. There is no question that there is an ancient temple that res resembles Jerusalem in northern China. The question is, what was the name of that place, the land, in the past? Because we're going to get to the point in reading this that Genghis Khan destroyed this temple. <laughs> now I've explained to you from reading the book of Jashir, the Exodus and the Punic Wars are happening at the same time. That's the destruction of Carthage 
from Rome and the destruction of Egypt from the Most High. You're told that the Exodus happened at 12,000 BC. I'm telling you, it happened at the same time as the Punic Wars. You can read the book of Jashir, and you can read through the chapters as they're going back and forth, telling you what's happening at both locations. And then, the beauty of this is while we're learning about the Israelites and the Israelites' destruction at the hand of the Egyptians, we learn about Job. In the book of Jashir, and when we learn what Job is instructing the king to do by suggestion, because that's the role Job plays to the king of Egypt. Telling him that if the Israelites do not keep up with the number that you've given them to create in bricks to build, then dice the children up and put their children as the bricks in the mortar for each brick that they don't. Complete. This is Job's uh, suggestion. So when the Most High in the book of Job destroys Job's fornicating children, and again, the Most High instructed Job to do all these things. That's why Job is the Most High's faithful servant. Yes. That means the Most High instructed Job to give the orders to Pharaoh to make Job look powerful to Pharaoh so that Pharaoh would give Job so much substance and Job would be a wealthy man of the East. So with all these kingdoms going on, one of these emperors I had to know Job existed. We're probably going to find him written about the more we dive into the history of Asia. So, remember when you're reading the Bible, one more thing, remember when you're reading the Bible and the Most High is giving Moses instructions and he tells Moses to go to the Pharaoh. At the same time, the Most High is hardening the heart of Pharaoh to make Pharaoh say no to Moses. Why would the Most High send Moses in front of a king that could behead him just to hear no over and over again? Why? If you can answer that question, then you will understand more of the Most High than anybody else does. Why would he give him instructions to go to the Pharaoh to say, release my people, but at the same time, harden the heart of Pharaoh and say, do not release the people. If you don't know the story of the Exodus. This would be a good day for you to start reading the story. We'll continue with this a little bit later. Thank you for joining. Thank you for watching. I appreciate you all. And I'm sorry to do this to you all. I'm sorry to force you to study. This is not difficult, having every word on screen so you can see it yourself. See you soon. Shalom.